talking about, they were talking about the fact that when I publicized this reading, I had a real quandary because um, Saeed is gay, and that's important. It's important for us to support the LGBT community, and I wanted people to know, and Pittsburgh, he's not a Pittsburgh man, right? So Terrence, people know Terrence here in Pittsburgh. Smart people know Terrence here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, so when I did this, I put out flyers, I put out ads, I did everything you do to get people to look forward to reading like this, and I said that they were both award-winning, but I called Saeed a award-winning gay poet, and I just called I just called Terrence an award-winning poet. <laughs> so I took some flack for that, and somebody said, why didn't you call it an African-American poet? Some people said it's clear that um, Saeed was gay because you read it in his bio, and I said, well, um, some people I know, I work in advertising, it's the headline, you gotta get it out in the headline. So I took some flack for it and whatever, I tried to make the best decisions I could. And then when I went back in the green room to get these guys, they were talking about it. <laughs> and so I went to them, I, you know, again, I did the best I could. I didn't ask either one of them, by the way. I just did what I thought was right. So it'd be interesting to hear what they have to say. I mean, we were really just talking about language, how much a word can do or not do, whether it closes down conversations or opens conversations. And so I think that's connected to, I mean, part of the conversation is about heart and about what we really can do with language to enact change. But can I don't hear it. Yeah, would you guys yeah. come up? Can you guys yeah. come up? Oh. oh, okay, okay. And then they can say that. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, you know, so um, I, I, I'll tell you why I, I don't have a problem being called a gay boy. You call me whatever you want. If you don't you know, pay for me to be somewhere, uh, you know, and there's an audience and I get to do what I love. Um, but you know, it's uh, so I'm the editor of BuzzFeed LGBT, and so I really I identify with um, Leslie in terms of you know how you try to appeal to an audience and you know get people to stop um, and, and pay attention. And you know, it's it's a, and so we were talking about like all of the functions of words, you know. So um, like gay poet in you know in a in a bio or an advertisement for a poetry reading, you know, it brings up so much. You know, on one hand, you know, it's 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 signaling. Right, you know, so, you know, to, you know, the 20 year old college student, you know, at Carnegie Mellon who um, is maybe in the process of coming out and maybe doesn't have a lot of gay friends and wants to learn more, make connections, you know, that word's really important. You know, that word could be like a light, an open sign. It's like, oh, that's something I can go to, you know. Uh, you know, for people who don't want to hear um, about the LGBT experience, you know, that could be a keep out sign, you know, and that's fine. Bye. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, but the, the, then there's also, you know, the complication of people saying, well, why does he have to be a gay poet? You know, like, why, why you know, in terms of you know, a black poet, a jazz poet, you know, how we name things is so interesting. And, um, you know, with my job, you know, I'm always trying to uh, share stories, you know, from across the LGBT spectrum, news stories, long form essays, those BuzzFeed lists that people love to get so worked up about. Um, and so it, it is interesting that, you know, sometimes I will have to put transgender, you know, in, in a title for something I'm editing for another writer, when really it's just a story of like a father trying to reconnect with his son, and sure, he happens to be transgender, but I know, you know, that word again is a signal. You know, and so it's so complicated. And so we were talking about all of these things. We were talking about activist and ally and political poetry. CIS, which I just learned. Oh, CIS. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. So we were like just in. Come on. Come on. So yeah. Get up. Get up here. So talk. Yeah. No. We yeah. We were just talking about sort of the, the evolution, I mm -hmm. guess, of language. I mean, ultimately, what I said was whatever people think a, a phrase means: CIS, gay, black. It's the work always. I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> kiss, kiss. I just learned it, so I'm going to say CIS. Crime Central. What is it? CSI. <laughs> so the terms, the proliferation, the proliferation of terms that, versus what we try to do in our work, which is elaborate and explode terms. So, a side note, part of the conversation was me calling a woman with no kids matriarchal, and then she was like offended. And I was like, but that's like. Patriarchal is offensive, but not patriarchal. So it was a conversation about, can we reclaim a word? Can we take a word and drop it and crack it open? Or are we always sort of a prisoner to it? So that if you see gay poet, depending on how narrow you think that means, that's a very limiting word. But if you think, oh, that means 
a million different things. It's another kind of phrase. So really what I experienced, and it came up because I was like, people kept coming up to me and asking me why only one adjective, you know, why that adjective? And so what I would say is, oh, I know, Saeed, I know it's work. When you come, you'll see just how rich that term is or how much it holds. But that is the question, like how much is a word a limitation or is it a, uh, is it a bottomless right. pit of possibilities? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, like that's, that is the work of poets, right? You know, mm -hmm. to have like a, um, a kind of, I don't know, I feel like I have a productively ambivalent relationship to language. Um, you know, because it, it can, it can, you know, because I'm interested in the possibilities, and you know, and I, um, I love like subverting, and I love turning, you know, and so you know, a bod, a poem that's supposed to be, you know, a romantic poem about lovers parting at dawn, and you know, supposed to be sweet and sorrowful. Now it is about you know a state-sanctioned execution of two teenagers, you know, and the implications of all of that. You know, I think. Um, one reason America needs poetry is because, like, America's, like, really lazy when it comes to language, you know, and words. Um, and I, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think um, people in position of power always have a lot to gain, um, you know, from our, like, casual, <laughs> lazy, you know, relationship to language. And so, yeah, I think it's always, um, that's what we're always doing. That's the work, you know. That's why we're obsessed with words and images. Like, um, at Carnegie Mellon, um, to, as we move along and like push it out. Um, a student asked me about the I in, in my poems. Um, and you know, is it, is that always me? Are these poems autobiographical? Um, you know, often, you know, readers may think it is. I've been asked, you know, based on some of the poems, like, you know, so as a survivor of, you know, child abuse or, you know, um, domestic violence. And that's not really the case. Um, I was, uh, my senior year, I was, I was gay bashed um, by a guy I went home with at a party. And so that really, that, intersection of violence and sex uh, certainly informs my work. Um, but the I is rarely me in my poems, you know, and it's, it's just not something I think about. Um, but it was, again, so interesting, you know, seeing what, what the I means for people and, you know, is it, is it um, uh, dishonest, you know, to, to use an I in your poetry and make it seem like it's, is it dishonest, you know, is it okay if you only do it sometime and not all the time, you know? These are such interesting questions, which is why poetry is just, yeah, I was just thinking about, I'm still thinking about heart because it always comes back mm -hmm. to it, like what is social change, so yeah. connected to the eye. What I was really thinking is complicating what change is. So for me, you know, a monk or a really good person, I'm interested in changing them to being a little bit bad. <laughs> and then a bad person, whatever that is, yeah. you want to give them a little bit more optimism. So it becomes a sort of, you know, the possibility for change doesn't go always to just sort of uh, rainbows mm -hmm. and kittens. Sometimes it goes to, to something else. And so, so I'm always thinking about that. I mean, I think it's in the new work and it's always a question of like, what is it? What are you trying to change? Who are you trying to change? Are you trying to change yourself? If the I isn't you, are you still figuring out how that other I, that other person that you're sort of projecting is speaking back to, you know, the you that sits there and kind of constructs it. And so I think that still folds into a notion of, uh, you know, what is your obligation as a poet that wants to change the world, however you want to change it, uh, sexism, racism, classism, personism. And I think, you know, I think like striving for complexity, um, you know, like Ralph Ellison, like you don't get more complex than that. He was an awful husband, a real jerk, um, but, you know, an amazing artist, an amazing thinker, and, you know, it's just so complicated. And, and so I think that the striving for complexity is um, political. I think it's, it's, it's a political agenda. You know, I'm always interested in um, complicating the way, you know, particularly, you know, young gay men or black men in general or just, you know, humans are portrayed, you know, and so that's why, you know, uh, the two poems about my mom, you know, two very different um, approaches to this, the same narrative, you know, the, the relationships between mothers and sons, between grief, between, um, you know, femininity and masculinity, you know, I think um, the worst, the worst kind of poetry, and when I say that I mean the kind of poetry that does the greatest disservice to people, is the kind that renders us, you know, um, so vaguely um, and I think what I love about 
Terence's poetry in particular um, is that, you know, no one gets up clean <laughs> by the end of the poem, right? You know, ev everyone is complicated and, and, and even the language is complicated. I think of like you have the poem in um, Lighthead of, what is it, um, about the, it's like the, the uncle beating mm -hmm. your cousin. Mm -hmm. And there's the analogy oh, of like, yeah, 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 and yeah, the speaker's yeah, cousin, thank you. Uh, see, <laughs> see? Uh, and the, and the, the analogy of like the, the fish bones being caught in the mouth. And in, in the poem itself, I find like it's difficult to actually say out loud because the language is so complicated. You know, you can't just like breeze through it. And I just love it because I think when we're breezing through poetry, when we're breezing through um, our, you know, humanness, you know, we're not, we're not doing the work. We're not doing the work. Do y'all have any questions? He's not going to be here tomorrow. Y'all better get these questions. <laughs> uh, wonderful work, by the way, both of you. Um, you know, I was wondering if you'd like to share, you had, you had mentioned mentors, and uh, just wondering, you know, teacher, perhaps your mother, uh, a, a mentor, who were some of the influences that, you know, that really allowed you to create that positive force in the messages that you're sending out? Uh, uh, um, my mom, uh, my mother didn't graduate from college, but she kept the books um, she had um, from her time at the University of Memphis. And so, you know, there was a bookshelf with Alice Walker and James Baldwin and Toni Morrison that I just kept finding my way to. And 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 so, um, I, I, and I'm really serious about the idea of mentors in the, on the page. Um, and, and getting to study. Part of it is like that distance, you know, when you're isolated and, you know, it's easier now, you know, um, but uh, that was huge. And then, um, yeah, I just kept running to people who had faith in me, you know, so at Western Kentucky University, Tom Hunley, um, who I joke is just like this, uh, it, it, totally like the seeming antithesis of me. Um, and it's uh, sometimes really funny to see, think of the two of us together or see us together. But he was just a great mentor and encouraged me uh, to take what I was doing seriously. And so um, the first poem I ever got published was actually a response to one of Terence's poems, and it was in Tom's class. Um, and I wouldn't have written the poem had Tom not introduced me um, to Terence's work. And I certainly wouldn't have tried to publish it because, you know, I just didn't know, you know. I think um, the idea of permission is really political. And I think, you know, um, I'll say it. If you're, you know, a straight, straight white man, you rarely need to worry about permission. Um, but I think a lot of times women, I think people of color, I think, you know, people of different classes, you know, sometimes we, we, we feel the need or are told that we need permission to do things. And, um, and so I got that permission. And uh, I studied at uh, studied creative writing at Rutgers Newark, and Rigoberto Gonzalez, uh, Tiari Jones were just amazing mentors. Um, and now, yeah, now it's when, when I'm so lucky to like make a connection with a writer and you know stalk them online and you know whatever. Usually, it's not you know like Terrence aren't like talking every day or anything like that. You know, sometimes I think just studying a poem is enough, and sometimes I would rather do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have questions. Um, so I had a, another a great mentor, Cynthia Cruz. Ooh, she's such a good poet, a great teacher. Um, she described once as poems as machines. She was like, they're, they're these mean little machines made out of images and sounds. And I just love that. And so, yeah, I think of my poems as machines. And I think um, that, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the chapbook um, and in the uh, full-length collection, which expands on those same poems, all set in the South, um, the, there's this persona of the boy, who's usually the I throughout the poem. And um, 
the boy was my machine. He was, he was my, my vehicle to take on the ideas I wanted to take on. I knew I wanted to talk about the intersection of race and sexuality. I knew I wanted to take, talk about the South. I knew, you know, all of these things. How do I do this? Um, I don't, my, my daily life is not interesting enough, really, uh, to be in poems in a prominent way. So I needed, I needed a machine to do that, and that was the I. Um, I don't know if you, if you feel the same way. Yeah. Um, well, you can email me. <laughs> He's here, though. Uh, can I say something about the... So I, I, uh, I gave a talk one time, like a uh, commencement address to a bunch of MFA kids that were graduating, and the question was, do you think the poem is an animal or a machine? Hmm. So that's not a right or wrong answer, but I think if you think it's a machine, it means that you can master it, that you can control it, mm. and have it do, as machines do, exactly what you want it to do. Mm. But if it's an animal, it's like a pet, or maybe a kid, where you, can, <laughs> you know, you train it, and you give it good manners, mm. you say like, don't pee on the carpet, and sometimes <laughs> it, it still pees on the carpet, but you don't quite own it, mm. you know what I mean? And so I think more like Robocop, like it's, mm. a, it's kind of an animal, oh, but you okay. want it to have some of the capacities that machines have, but. So that's all I think. Like I think, I mean, it's a great question. Like, do you view language as a machine to be mastered, or, or an animal to be sort of trained and negotiate, you know, with? So how about that? Hmm. The I, yeah, I, I think the I, the notion that the I is always autobiographical. You know, you can really take advantage of it. So I like for people to think it's me, and then because then I seem so much more interesting. <laughs> than I am. But I also I like to lie for that reason. I find great liberty and. And misleading people because they presume that the I yeah. is is me. Yeah. I, like I have a, a much more interesting sex life than my writing. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Cool. Sure, sure. Sure. On my sex life. Okay. That's where we're gonna end. Thank y'all. Thanks for coming out. I want to thank. Thank you all for coming. Please do buy books, and um, and these gentlemen will be happy to sign them for you. And um, please look for the next heart reading because um, we're going to be out there, and I'm going to come up with some great adjectives.